one on is called the SOFIA, which stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And we're going to take you through each of those parts, um, starting with the stratosphere. Many people asked us and have still asked, did you guys go to space? And we did not, in fact, go to a space. We went to the stratosphere. Um, and just a quick review for you, the stratosphere, um, there are different layers within the atmosphere. So the lowest one down here is the troposphere, and that is where all of the weather happens. Right above that is the stratosphere, and that is where airplanes fly. The SOFIA goes up to, we've got up to as high as 43,000 feet. Most typical airplanes are about 35, 40,000. Um, so we were able to go a little bit higher than most normal airplanes. And then above the stratosphere, you can see is the mesosphere, and that is where when meteors enter into the Earth, where they start to burn up. And then above that is the ionosphere, the thermosphere, and then eventually the exosphere. The thermosphere is where um, satellites go around, and then the exosphere is out into space. So space is all the way up here at the top, and we were down here. Um, another common question that we got from a lot of our students, in particular the students in the lower school, was did you go gravityless? Were you still with gravity or not? And we were just like we are right now. It was a 747 um, special airplane, which we'll tell you more about as we continue. So the SOFIA is a flying observatory. It is the only airborne observatory in the world. And there are a couple of things that make it special and why we need an, a flying observatory. Most of us, when we think of observatories, we think of them on top of mountains or in locations that are pretty dark with not a lot of light pollution. And um, the top image up here you can see is a pretty typical observatory. Then there are other observatories that we have out there, like the Hubble Space Telescope. That is another kind of observatory that goes around um, the Earth, and that collects certain types of images. So for instance, the Hubble, that collects um, near-infrared images. What's neat about the SOFIA is that it is flying, and it can land. At, in the morning, because we observe at night, it can land and you can put on different instruments. So sometimes we'll be looking in the visible light spectrum, sometimes in the far infrared or the mid infrared. So that makes it pretty unique. Another exciting part about it is that it can have maintenance happen to it pretty routinely. So if there is something that is not quite right, they can bring it down, fix it, and then have it go back up the next day or a couple days later to observe more. The last thing well, is... And that's, that's such a great point. Um, because as many of you remember, many of you know, the, the Hubble uh, infamously had uh, problems with its mirrors, with its instrumentation. Very early on, uh, it was recognized that they were getting unclear images. Uh, the mission that was designed to repair the Hubble telescope was one of the most complex uh, NASA missions that's ever been designed. Um, and there are uh, tons of great stories from astronauts who've been up to the Hubble to uh, do these ongoing repairs, but it's rather expensive and it requires sending astronauts to orbit. Um, all you have to do to fix a flying telescope is land the plane, which makes things much simpler. And the last thing is that it is able to carry educators like Mike and myself. Um, and there also can be journalists that come on. And what's so neat about that is that non-scientists, regular people like us, are able to join on a scientific mission for a night or you can go um, for more than that. The other great part of that is the scientists submit their proposals for what they would like to study. Um, and this is true for all telescopes, um, if they're on land, the Hubble, or the SOFIA. And a lot of the scientists don't actually get to work with their data as it's coming in. With the SOFIA, the scientist has the option to fly aboard the SOFIA, and they can analyze their data as it's coming in, which is pretty unique. The SOFIA was not the first airborne observatory. Um, back in 1975, NASA decided that it should start and have an airborne observatory, so it started with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. Um, and it was in commission until 1996, and this had a 36-inch, right up here, reflecting telescope um, that was in the front of the airplane. This is also where the Amateur Astronomer um, Ambassador Program started, which is what Mike and I are now a part of. Um, so this idea of bringing educators on board missions started with the Kuiper. SOFIA is actually not uh, solely a NASA program. It's actually a partnership between uh, the American and German space programs. The German space program is called DLR. Um, and, and obviously the American space program is NASA. And there are a lot of other sponsors that are involved in SOFIA. Um, but it's an interesting partnership. Um, 
Germany uh, is responsible for about 20% of the programming on board SOFIA. So 20% of the flights are chosen and selected by the DLR. Uh, a, a certain percentage of the flights are selected and chosen by NASA, and the rest go to a committee uh, of the two. So it's a truly international collaboration uh, in the scientific sense. It's also an international collaboration in terms of the, the aircraft itself. Um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the plane and its structure, uh, but it was put together uh, and designed by German scientists and scientists from the U.S. And it's actually, uh, it's housed in Palmdale, California on, uh, in a NASA hangar. But once every uh, year, or two years rather, uh, the plane is decommissioned for up to six months while they uh, take apart the plane piece by piece to every nut and bolt to clean uh, every component of this instrument. And that's actually done on site in Germany. Uh, so yet another advantage to having an airborne observatory is that it can be a truly international collaboration. It can live in different countries at different times, and participate in uh, different research for different scientists in different places. So where the Kuiper had a 36-inch telescope, the SOFIA was the next generation of the airborne observatories, and it has a 2.5 meter, 17-ton telescope in the back of the airplane. Um, you can see in the back, that is where the telescope is housed. We'll show you the interior of it um, a little bit later on. But it is the world's largest flying observatory, and it is used, as I said earlier, for both infrared and visible observing. Um, it was first commissioned in uh, 2007 was the first flight test and then the first scientific research flight was in 2008. And um, it also spends one month per year down in New Zealand doing flights down there so it can get a better look at the Galactic Center. Um, and also the German Space Agency comes over and spends about 20% of the time observing as well. The first sort of piece of science that we're going to talk about tonight is one of the target observations for SOFIA. They have three primary research targets. We'll get to the other two in a bit. Uh, but the first one actually has to do with the fact that it is this portable uh, airborne observatory. And that has to do with something we call occultation. So essentially, when we're looking up at the sky, we have lots of different ways to make observations. We're going to talk a little bit about spectral analysis later and chemical composition. Uh, but one of the simplest ways that we can look at the sky and find out information about the objects we're studying is by first looking at the background and then waiting for something to get in the way. And so essentially, what we can do with an airborne uh, observatory is we can point up at the night sky on a clear night and get a very uh, sort of boring picture of the background. Now, for scientists, that's not a boring picture. Uh, but it becomes even more interesting when something like a planet passes into the field of view of the telescope. Because we can see the difference between the background images and the foreground images, we've got the opportunity to use the entire universe relative to Earth as a background for taking pictures, for taking information in through our telescopes and studying the occultation of the background stars. And so this gives SOFIA a particularly unique place in astronomy. It can fly to anywhere in the world at any time, and we can point our telescope in whichever direction we need to make observations. So if there's a really exciting uh, comet that's only seen from the southern hemisphere, we can fly the plane there and make observations. If there's uh, you know, an inconvenient uh, weather system, well, the stratosphere is above the weather, isn't it? So we can get to convenient locations and we can use this uh, occultation for all kinds of different research. And we'll talk a little bit more about the types of research that NASA is doing uh, further into the presentation. So how did we get involved? Um, this is an image of a tweet that went out from um, the Astronomical Society that was announcing the 2014 um, teachers, educators, who were selected to be part of the amateur astronomy program. But this goes a little bit back before um, when a bunch of our science team went down to a National Science Teachers Conference down in Texas. And there's a big convention hall and you go around to different booths and get information and ideas and they try and sell you products that you might want to use. And there was a NASA booth and so I wandered over to the NASA booth and it just so happened to be about the SOFIA. And the people presenting there said, do you want to go to space? And I said, well, yes, as do all of my fourth grade students. And they kind of said, great, we can't really take your fourth graders there, and we can't take you to space, but we can get you probably pretty close, and as close as you're going to get maybe in your lifetime. 
So I said, great, what do we need to do? And they told me to find someone to go with me, um, where Mr. Macaron came in, and we went to a lecture about what the SOFIA was. And that piqued our interest. From there, we went through an application process, and we were selected as a team. Of, there's 12 teams of two people each, so we're one of 24 people to be selected for this cycle um, of educators, there are planetarium operators, there's college uh, professors that are also part of our cohort, and a lot of physics and astronomy teachers um, all over the country. When we went to fly, we were partnered with two other teachers, another team, and they actually happened to be from just across the river in New Jersey, which was a total coincidence, but quite fabulous. Um, so this was our announcement that we had made it. And part of um, the application process was that you have to create an education and outreach plan. Um, so Mr. Macron and I decided that part of our plan, we wanted to incorporate social media into the experience. So this was a perfect way for them announcing to us that we had been accepted. Um, and as throughout our journey, we also were tweeting and using Instagram and blogging about the experience along the way. So you'll see a couple of our social media um, outlets as we go. So our journey out to California started, we went to Palmdale. Um, Mike mentioned before that there is a hangar that where the Sophia lives, and this is a NASA hangar. Um, this is right here, they call it Building 703, um, and it is part of the newly named Neil Armstrong Flight Research Center, um, which was previously Dryden. Um, and it is just a hangar. Inside the hangar they have the Sophia, which is the largest plane in there, and then about four or five other NASA aircrafts that are studying other um, parts. There's one that's studying uh, the different parts of ice down in um, Antarctica. So we got to see that plane, we didn't get to go aboard it. Um, but the Sophia comes out and leaves from Palmdale. And on our flight, we flew all the way across the country, about to uh, Virginia, I believe. And then we flew back down through the Panhandle, up through Texas, and back over to California. And this, on our very first night that we were there, we actually um, were not able to go on our originally scheduled flight on Sophia. They were commissioning an instrument, which Mr. Macron will talk about in a little bit. Um, but we were able to go to the flight briefing and then also to another spot just off of the property where we could watch the airplane take off. So the top images up here are a picture of the Sophia taking off um, into the sky and kind of in a desert moon in the background um, as it flew overhead. And then the bottom two images when we were when we were aboard our flight. Um, so the first one over here is as we were climbing, and then the second one was when we were up into the stratosphere. So Palmdale, uh, California is absolutely, without a doubt, the middle of the desert. Uh, it's really hot, really dry, and very boring. Uh, but the air is also really clear, and the sky is incredible at night. Um, so we were able to, uh, as we're you know, out, outside in Palmdale, just walk around even in the middle of a, a shopping mall parking lot, look up and see a full uh, sky full of stars, even on a, a fairly full lit moon, um, which is unusual, uh, especially for New Yorkers. It, it was a sight to behold. Um, we thought that was fairly clear. If you look at the pictures here, though, when you look at the background, the atmosphere, uh, from our perspective, looks fairly cloudy. Um, and this was actually a pretty clear night, uh, but compared to the images below, which are taken from uh, the aircraft as we entered the stratosphere, uh, you can see that that background is, is much, much different. And what we're gonna talk to you about now is why bother flying up to the stratosphere? Uh, it has a lot to do with infrared light. We're gonna talk about and remind you about uh, the nature of infrared and what that means, but a lot of the light that pours out from the sun, from other stars, and from everywhere else in the universe gets deflected by the atmosphere. And so what we were able to do is sort of get just above that point where there's water vapor in the atmosphere to a point where uh, we've got much more clarity of view. And that clarity of view allows scientists who aren't looking in necessarily the visible spectrum, but in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to make more clear observations. Part of our mission uh, as astronomy ambassadors was to communicate this message, not just to uh, our own community and to high school students 
or even middle school students, but Lizzie was one of the first uh, lower school, if not the first lower school teacher to be invited aboard the plane. So we took really seriously the mission of trying to communicate these ideas to our lower school students. And we're gonna walk you now through uh, one of the exercises that uh, we conducted with these lower school students. So to a lower school student, think, put yourself in a six-year-old's body um, and six-year-old's mind. Infrared is a really tough concept. You're kind of thinking, what is infrared? So we approached it with this idea of invisible light. There's light out there that we can't see, but that we know works. This remote, for instance, has a light on it. If we look up here, our remote controls, that's infrared that's being used. When we cook our food in a microwave oven, those are microwaves that are helping us. When we get x-rays to see our bones, those are x-rays. So this idea that there's a light out there that you can't see is where we started with the lower school students. From there, we briefly showed them the electromagnetic spectrum. And with the lower school students, we focused on this idea that there are different waves. So if we look right here in the middle, we can see that there's visible light, the light that we can see. When you look outside, you can, you can see light. But there's all this other light. So that invisible light is what we see all down on this side and all down on that side. And they have different wavelengths. So we kind of stopped there <laughs> with the lower school students and went on to an exercise that we're going to do with you in just a minute. Um, but to explain the electromagnetic spectrum more, there are different wavelengths that are in there. And as we look at them, you can see that on one side we have our longer wavelengths that are the radio waves. And as you progress down the electromagnetic spectrum, they get smaller and smaller as you get to the gamma rays. So these, uh, these frequencies, uh, as the frequency increases, you notice in the visible spectrum, we're going to talk in a minute about what, what is that frequency used for, um, as the frequency changes, uh, we've got different sort of wave sizes and wave interactions. And so we know uh, from studying these things in science in, in middle school and science in high school, uh, we know that some of these things can be really useful. When we think about radio waves, we're not just thinking about you know, radio uh, on our, in our cars or uh, you know, in, our, in our radios at home, but any kind of radio communication. So our wireless telephones, our cell phone systems all uh, work around the size of radio waves. And as we increase the frequency, uh, we change the shape and size of the wave to decrease. And that's fine when we get to uh, things like humans, butterflies, and even uh, you know, infrared. When we talk about the size of an infrared wave, what we're talking about is a wave with a wavelength so small it's about the size of a needle point. But none of these things are damaging to us. Uh, even visible light, as we know, uh, is certainly not damaging. When we get to something like ultraviolet light, now all of a sudden, the waves are around the same size as molecules. And this can be problematic if waves carry energy and they're at just the right size to transfer that energy to molecules, they can do things like cause sunburn. And that's why ultraviolet light is so dangerous. As those waves get even smaller, they become the size of atoms and even atomic nuclei. And that's why x-rays allow you to see through the skin and only reflect off of the bone because the bone is so dense and small. When we get to something like a gamma ray, all of a sudden now we're talking about nuclear interactions, and that's why these waves become so dangerous. It's all part of that same spectrum. It's all part of that same light. And so a beam of light from the sun might carry several different frequencies and might even carry the entire spectrum. When we look for uh, absorption spectra in elements from the sun, what we're looking at is what's missing. But basically all of the visible light and most of these, this other light travels through the universe all at the same speed until it's deflected by something like our atmosphere. So we're going up into the stratosphere where most of the stuff isn't blocked out. Fortunately, we're not too worried about things like gamma rays, but there are x-rays, there are other things that we need to shield the instruments from, and we also want to open the telescope up to be able to see this part of the spectrum, which would also get blocked out.